three women, three murders, similar situations. It all happened just nine months apart more than 40 years ago in Monroe. Could these women share the same killer? Hello and thank you for joining us. I'm Chelsea Monet and this is an Arklamas Most Wanted Special. Tonight, we're taking a deep dive into a 40-year-old mystery that continues to haunt the victim's families and those who were around at the time of the murders. Four decades later, these cases are getting another look from detectives. Are police any closer to solving these murders? Angie Hill, Kathy Wharton, and Sherry Alford, all gone too soon. Although it's been more than 40 years since their murders, there's a team of people fighting for their justice like Kevo Meredith and Carol Brown. Kevo and Carol are friends and when they learned the stories of these three ladies, they just knew they had to help. I saw the Facebook page, the Destination Justice, Justice for Sherry Alford, Angie Hill and Kathy Horton, and I started following it. So I've kind of been following it over the years. She says she has a front row seat to watch the power of social media and believes without it, the cases would not have gained as much attention. Between the podcast, social media, I, I think it's a powerful thing. Like I told the sisters, you know, in a lot of ways time's against you, but then in a lot of ways time is for you because of all the changes in, with social media and the podcast and technology, DNA testing, all the different things that are there now that weren't there in the early 80s are gonna be the things that make the difference in solving these crimes. I truly believe that. Carol says she's dove way deeper into these cases than she ever expected. Kevin and I met with the sisters and then it just took off from there. They were all three in a vehicle and somehow, some way, were lured into a pulling over or bumped into to pull over or something to that effect. Kevo and Carol started a podcast, Destination Justice, and interviewed the sisters of all three victims and have become advocates for the victims and their families. We start with Angie Hill. In August of 1980, Angie was found murdered on the south side of Monroe. Her body discovered near an industrial park near Richwood Road Number 2. Her vehicle was found in the, the Lakeshore area uh, around Melvin Drive. There's a shopping center there. It was, it was found there as if Angie had just stepped out of the vehicle and vanished, like it, engine running, lights on, radio playing, etc. Angie was planning a normal night out as she was getting off of work. She had worked at a convenience store, which is right off what was then NLU, right off campus on, on uh, Desired, Highway 80 Desired. She left there, took a coworker home, and uh, was en route to take the night's deposit, uh, uh, cash to the owner or boss's house, which she always did. This was not an uncommon thing and never made it there. In 2021, we spoke to Angie's sister, Dorothy Hill. She's heartbroken and wants answers. I'm 64, and so that's four decades. And at best, I may have two decades left. If I'm lucky, I may have four, but we all know the last two of those won't be pleasant. So it would just be really beneficial to, not so much, knowing the who would be wonderful, but also, more importantly, the why. Coming up, nine months after Angie's murder, Kathy Wharton's car was found abandoned, engine running in the middle of the street and her body on the south side of Monroe, just like Angie. She was on her way to a friend's home and her vehicle was found a lot like Angie's. Kathy's story is after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back. In 1981, Kathy Wharton's car was found abandoned, engine running in the middle of the street. She had been murdered and her body dumped on the other side of town. This was the second woman in nine months to receive a similar fate. Could these women share the same killer? 
This is Kathy Wharton. She was a 19-year-old college student at NLU, the Bible study teacher to little children at her church. On April 4, 1981, Kathy and friends had gone out for a night on the town, stopping by two different bars. They wrapped up the night with a meal. Kathy was en route to a friend's house, but never made it. She was on her way to a friend's home that lived right off the college campus, and her vehicle was found a lot like Angie's. A lot like the previous victim, Angie Hill. Nine months prior, Angie's car was also found abandoned near the college campus. Kathy's car was found on Sherouse Avenue. Right off campus. Her vehicle too was found, door open, radio playing, just as if there was just, somebody just stepped out of the vehicle and just poof. Authorities called the owners, Kathy's parents, to retrieve the vehicle. A short time later, short, short time later, they would get a phone call that a, a young Caucasian female's body was found again, somewhere on the south side of Monroe. Kathy Wharton had been shot just like Angie Hill. Same way, same way. Both were, um, both drove through around that university shortly before they were abducted. When Kathy's body was recovered, there was something missing, a ring she had been wearing that night it was never found. Kevo interviewed Kathy's sister, Debbie Wilson, on his podcast, Destination Justice. She recalled the strength and faith her father showed during that difficult time. And he, he just thanked God. You know, he didn't say, God, why did you do this? He just, he, he said, he said, thank you for giving her to us for 19 years. I, could, I don't know that I could have that, that strength, but he sure showed it to me that day. Nine months after Kathy's murder, Sherry Alford's car was found on side of the road with shattered glass from gunshots in her body outside of her vehicle. That 1130 to 1157 remains a mystery to this day. And we cannot figure out what all happened in that 27 minutes, but we do know what the end result was. Sherry's story is after the break. We'll be right back. sticking with us in this 30-minute Arklamas Most Wanted special. We're talking about three women who were murdered just nine months apart more than 40 years ago in Monroe and the similarities that each case shares. In 1982, Sherry Alford's car was found on side of the road with shattered glass from gunshots in her body outside of her vehicle. This was the third woman in 18 months to face a similar and tragic fate. So the question remains, could these women share the same killer? Sherry Lynn Alford, young, beautiful, and forever 16. It was February 1st, 1982. Sherry had gotten off of work and went to visit her boyfriend. In the town and country area to study uh, some chemistry or science or something and uh, left there with her curfew approaching, knowing she needed to be home for a curfew. She left there around 11.30, and the, that 11.30 to 11.57 remains a mystery to this day. And we cannot figure out what all happened in that 27 minutes, but we do know what the end result was. Sherry had been shot Left for dead, and the worst part, her body was found. Maybe a half mile from her home on 139. Although Sherry's situation sounds a lot like what Angie Hill 
and Kathy Wharton had gone through months earlier. Something was different. The initial investigation indicate Sherry had been shot twice, and according to investigators, the shattered glass discovered on the scene is consistent with the theory that Sherry was first shot before she stopped her car, one of those bullets striking the watch on her wrist. At 11.57, because her watch on her left wrist had quit working, Evidence suggests Sherry was likely exiting her car in an attempt to run away from her killer when the final shot was fired, striking her in the head. And just like the previous victims, Kevo spoke with Sherry's sister, Tammy Riley, on his Destination Justice podcast. She recollects how things changed and how the murders set in motion an overwhelming fear in the community. It probably changed the way everything. Yeah, everything changed. It, it, the way you left the house, the way you uh, curfews, everything just went. Yeah, I imagine. I felt like um, at fourteen, you're really not mature. Right. And I feel like I matured real fast after Sherry died. It just, it just. It life did just did that. You. Yeah, life was. Um, you saw a different side mm -hmm. of things, like evil. Coming up, we've learned the stories of Angie Hill. Kathy Wharton and Sherry Alford. Join us after the break as we hear from law enforcement because they're back on the case. You're watching an Arklamas Most Wanted special on Fox 14. gone over the details in each case pointing out their similarities. Now we turn to law enforcement. What is being done today to hopefully get some answers? All three women were killed in Monroe, but investigations fell under different jurisdictions. Kathy and Sherry's case is being worked by the Washita Parish Sheriff's Office and Angie's by the Monroe Police Department. We spoke to both agencies. Even though they're over 40 years old, like we've discussed before, the cases are being actively investigated at this time. Yeah, it's active. we're actively investigating. We've got a uh, detective assigned to it currently, yeah. Advocates Kevo and Carol's efforts are relentless and never wavering. It's like we really feel like we're on the right track. I'm telling you, Carol has herself experienced some very odd things that she feels like is a sign and we're just we feel like we're on the right track. On the right track, as they hope detectives are too, with a word of encouragement. I would say, please stay the course. Please, God, stay the course. Don't, 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 don't get sidetracked. I think, I think you're on the right track, so don't stop, and we appreciate what you're doing for the families. Both agencies assure us the cases are being worked, and they are working together to ensure no stone is left unturned. Then our detective talks to their lead detective and, you know, I, I communicate with the sheriff's department about this as well to make sure that we work together because they worked together back then. And if there's any evidence involved in either side, we want to make sure we're running it down correctly. We'll take any new lead. Uh, we've been actively working with the family and we'd ask the public that if anybody has any information, even though this is several years ago, we will take that and actively investigate that at this time. These cases may be old, but not cold. We're looking at over 40 years, and but it is good to revisit it for the family to see if there is anything new with new technology uh, that's coming about every day. Um, maybe we can you know, find something. New technology. Has new evidence been sent up to the lab recently? Well. There again, I can't, I can't get into that right now because it is an open investigation, but uh, you know, we're trying everything we can and we are working with the family the best we can uh, to get some type, of, to work toward maybe some type of closure. Not only were the families of these victims affected, but it shook an entire community. We sat down with some individuals who were around at the time of the murders and they say nothing was ever the same. It changed them and even affected the way they raised their own families. 
no one could be trusted. And I do mean no one. What I remember is being scared that, you know, if you met somebody or you could have known this person that you were talking, you, you're talking to them and they could be the one that did it, you know. There are things that I do today, 40 years later, because a classmate was murdered when I was 16 years old. I think it changed the way that we became parents. I don't walk in between cars right. and, and parking lots. I don't walk in between cars. I haven't since then. Everybody just got in almost lockdown mode. You know, the parents just, you know, just sort of said, hey, now we're going to be tight knit. We're going to watch every movie we make, especially the women and the younger girls. I would drive past that on the way home every day, and I just remember my parents talking about it. I'm like, wow, there was somebody that was killed. And it didn't really hit me until the last one. We don't need to ever stop talking about these women. Absolutely. We need to, to make sure that their memory stays alive, even if they are not here with us. And we owe them that. We owe them being here, talking about what happened, talking about our feelings about what happened, and knowing that someone, whether they realize it or not, someone knows something. Maybe the killer or killers are still alive. Maybe they're not. Either way, detectives will do their work. If somebody is still living that did commit this, that's not in jail, we wanna make sure that we get those people behind bars and, and through the justice system as quickly as we can. We're not giving up on investigating the case. And so will the advocates of these three women. We're not going away. We're not going to let this lie. I would say you need to get your affairs in order because your freedom's fixing to end. And it's gonna end soon. I have no doubt in my mind we're going to get you. And we're not scared of you. So your reign of terror has stopped, officially stopped, and you better get ready because you haven't met us yet. Got a tip? Or can you help bring closure to the victim's families? Learn how you can help or where to submit your tip after the break. We'll be right back. The families of Angie Hill, Kathy Wharton, and Sherry Alford are desperate for closure and can use your help. Submit your tip by calling Crime Stoppers of North Delta at 318-388-CASH or by visiting their website. Callers can remain anonymous and a $2,000 cash reward is available to anyone with information that leads to an arrest and or an indictment. Also, be sure to follow the Facebook pages dedicated to these women and download the Destination Justice podcast to hear interviews with the sisters of the victims. That's all for now. For Oklahoma's Most Wanted, I'm Chelsea Monet. Have a good night.